in the previous session, we talked about uh, the creatures of Job. There was one creature of Job that, due to time, I skipped over, that I'll just briefly go over now at the introduction of this talk, and that is the unicorn. Um, again, this is presented as another, you know, it's alongside of the dragon as one of those mythological creatures. So it's not really a real creature, people say. It's just a creature of mythology that the Bible talks about. Well, is that the case? Um, <clears throat> Wikipedia says the unicorn is a legendary animal that has been described since antiquity as a beast with a large pointed spiraling horn projecting from its forehead. Now, I guess that's not altogether false, is it? The unicorn is a legendary animal. It's in legends. It's not saying it's a mythical animal. It's a legendary animal. It's been around for a long time as a legend. And it's described as a beast with a large pointed spiraling, spiraling horn projecting from its forehead. So, unfortunately, the assumption that it's a horse with a, um, a horn that you commonly see, um, that's where the mythology comes in, okay? Because there's no basis for that belief. Let's have a look at what the Bible has to say about the unicorn. Um, it's the Hebrew word, rim, rim. And it's from a root word, ram, which means to rise or be lifted up. Strong says it means a wild bull or a unicorn. BDB, Brown Driver Briggs, says probably the great aurochs or wild bulls which are now extinct and the exact meaning is not known. Okay, so we're already we're getting closer to what the unicorn is. Okay? A great aurochs, which was a huge ancient bull that many um, historians write about, or a wild bull. And in the King James it occurs a total of nine times, six times in the singular form unicorn and three times in the plural. Um, now, <coughs> and uh, the King James then follows the Greek Septuagint um, in translating this word, which mono keros, mono means singular, keros means horn, and the Latin, vul vul Latin vulgate, unicornis. Um, other translations suggest it's a wild ox. But let's just have a quick look at how this word is used in Scripture. Um, Numbers 23 says, God brought them out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. That's a very strong animal, isn't it? Numbers 24 verse 8, God brought them out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. So again, it's the same thing. He shall eat up the nations and his enemies. So a literal animal is being used to symbolize the strength of God. The unicorn. So it's used in a very positive sense. With the dragon, a literal animal is used to symbolize Egypt, the power of sin. But here it's the other way. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17. His glory is like the firstlings of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. And with them, he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. Uh, Job 33. 39 verse 9, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? And Job 39 verse 10, canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow or will he harrow the valleys after thee? So these two quotes in Job are telling us quite clearly that you cannot tame it for domestic work. Okay, like an ox. It's something a lot more powerful that you cannot tame and keep on your farm. Um, Jude 33 says, possibly, it tells us possibly it's got more than one horn, see? And his horns are like the horns of a unicorn, because the plural is, word, uh, plural is used there for horns. In Psalm, we have a similar reference or inference that possibly there could be one more, there could be more than one horn. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Uh, and there's further quotes there. So I, I think I won't go over them, but the point here is that it's clearly a, a real animal in the Bible. It's very strong. Okay? You can't tame it. Okay? It's got enormous strength. 
and and uh, it's something that it, it's an animal that God uses in a positive sense, okay, to just to relate His strength in delivering His people. Now, I'm not going to propose like I did for the Leviathan and for the Behemoth one particular type of animal. My mind's a bit more open on this, so I'm not quite sure. But clearly, possibilities from small start from a rhino, okay, just a normal rhino. But there's evidence that there were super giant rhinos in the past. For example, in the Pliny the Elder, the first century, um, in his book Natural History, and what this is one of the largest single works to have survived from the Roman Empire to the modern day, and purports to cover all ancient knowledge. It's, it says there's an exceedingly wild beast called the Monoceros, okay? And that's where the Septuagint gets its translation for unicorn. One horn. It makes a deep, lowing noise, and one black horn, two cubits long, projects from the middle of its forehead. And he describes it in it, it's, it as like an elephant in length, but with much shorter legs. And so here's a picture of what they believed this animal, the, the unicorn or the rheum, could have looked like. Okay, a giant rhino, the elasmotherium. And you can see here, he is depicted to, compared to an elephant, similar to size. And there's ancient writings of Julius Caesar that describes the same, about this animal being similar in size to an elephant. So possibly it could be uh, what's known as the Elasmotherium, which is like an ancient giant um, rhino. But another possibility is the Ceratops, isn't it? Um, and there's a number of, and that's why I was emphasizing before that sometimes they appear with more than one horns, because the Ceratops family, okay, the, the one with one horn is called the Centrosaurus, okay, but the common one that we know of. Um, in all our dinosaur books, is the one with three horns called the Triceratops, isn't it? So I think possibly this is an explanation for the unicorn as well, the Ceratops or the Centrosaurs. All right, well, let's move on to historical accounts and go over a few historical accounts by reliable historians that verify the existence of dragons. And we're going to have a look at Herodotus in the 5th century BC, Alexander the Great, Pliny the Elder, who we just looked at in relation to the unicorn, um, Alien, uh, Philostratus, uh, the travels of Marco Polo, and also the Apocrypha in Daniel 14. And so these are all ancient uh, documents. Now, Herodotus, um, of course, is the Greek historian, and he noted these observations, and he wrote in the 5th century BC that there is a place in Arabia situated very near the city of Buto, to which I went on hearing of some winged serpents. And when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. The form of the serpent is like that of the water snake, but he has wings without feathers and as like as possible to the wings of a bat. Now what do you think that's describing? Okay. It's like a bones and spines like a serpent. Okay, but the form is like a water snake, but it's got the wings haven't got feathers on them. They're more like a bat. Well, isn't this what he's talking about? Okay. One of these pterodactyls. Okay, Alexander the Great. He said in 30, 330 BC, after Alexander the Great invaded India, he brought back reports of seeing a great hissing dragon living in a cave, which people were worshipping as a god. So one of Alexander's great lieutenants... Uh, Again, pronunciation, please forgive me. One is Socritus, or maybe it's only a Socritus, stated that the Indian king Abisaris kept serpents 
that were 37 and 64 metres long. And subsequent Greek rulers are said to have brought back dragons live from Ethiopia. So in India, okay, they saw, in India they saw great hissing dragons. And that's actually confirmed by Philostratus, okay, um, who wrote in 200 to 230 AD, and he, the famous writing he wrote, the li in the life of Apollinus of Tyana. So what he says here in, in his writings is that the whole of India is girt with dragons of enormous size. For not only the marshes are full of them, but the mountains as well. And there is not a single ridge without them. And the city under the mountain is of great size and is called Parasa, which may be Peshawar today. And, and that in the centre of it are enshrined a great many heads of dragons. And so he goes on to describe the, 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 the marsh kind, two different kinds. There's a marsh kind, okay, and then there's the mountain kind as well. Okay, now if you're interested, have a look at my presentation, all the slide, you know, you can read the detail of this. But I just simply want to say there's a lot more detail. There's pages and pages of how he describes these two types of dragons and how they're continually fighting and at war with the elephant and how the dragon would coil its tail around the elephant to get the upper hand, its long tail. And this as well is confirmed by Pliny the Elder, who we quoted before. He says, India produces the largest elephants as well as the largest dragons, which are perpetually at war with the elephants. The dragon is of so enormous size, and he's saying the same thing here, okay, as the previous historian did, that is easily able to envelope the elephant in its coils. Okay? Um, and also, he recorded that the dragons of Ethiopia were often seen twisted and interlaced together. Now, where have we seen that before? Okay, we've seen it on the, the Mesopotamian cylinder, Richard Bell's tomb, and the Nama plate in Egypt. Okay, where they're interlaced, their necks are bound or interlaced together. Now, there's a, an Eastern Church father by the name of John of Damascus. He wrote some interesting words about dragons. And this really ties together the historical accounts and the mythology. Because what happened in history is they were true stories, but people exaggerated them, exaggerated what the dragon could do, and in many cases worshipped it like a god. But he sets out to correct the exaggeration that was going on. He says some people claim that dragons can take both, both human form and turn, turn into serpents, which is clearly ridiculous, right? Sometimes small, sometimes huge, differing in body, length and size. They can change their form. People are saying that this can happen with dragons. So obviously this isn't true. And sometimes having turned into people, they start to associate with them and appear to seal women and consort with them. I mean, this is uh, clearly fantasy for, for novels. But so we ask, he goes on to say, those who tell such stories, how many intelligent beings did God create? And if they do not know the answer, we will respond to, I mean, humans and angels. Okay, this is what he says. God's created two intelligent beings. But if a dragon were to change its form, becoming at one moment a serpent and at another a man, it clearly follows that dragons are intelligent, beings greatly exceeding man, which never has been true and never will be. So they're very wise, very fair words. To counter this silly view that was going around that dragons could change form into humans. And he goes on to say, we should trust the teaching of Moses and more exactly the Holy Spirit having, having spoken through Moses. And this teaching reads, and God brought them to Adam to see what he called them and whatever Adam called them, called every living creature, that was its name. Now look at this. Hence, a dragon was one of the animals. Okay, one of the animals that God created. So he goes on to say, I'm not telling you after all that there are no dragons. Okay, he's not saying that, right? He's just 
arguing against this silly notion that dragons can change their form, this the fanciful notion. Dragons exist, but they are serpents, reptiles born of other serpents. When just born and young, they are small, but when they grow up and mature, they become big and fat so that they exceed other serpents in length and size. It's said that they grow up more than 30 cubits, 14 metres long, 45 feet for their thickness, they become as thick as a huge log. Okay, that's quite powerful, that. So, on the one hand, he's dispelling, okay, the fantasy idea that people were talking about, that dragons can change their form and could be worshipped as a god. And But on the other hand, he's verifying the fact that, that they existed, okay, that they were real animals. Moreover, they were part of the god's creation that were brought to Adam to name. Um, and also he wrote of more, okay, other small dragons as well. Um, he said that the dragon is a type of beast like the rest of the animals, for it is a goat-like beard, this is interesting, and a horn at the back of its head. Its eyes are large and gold-coloured. These dragons can either be big or small, and all serpent kinds are poisonous, except dragons, for they do not emit poisons. So... It's telling us some features about dragons, the historians can, that we can't get from the paleontologists. When you look at a dragon from the paleontologist's reconstruction in a museum, it looks like a terrible lizard or a snake, right? Pretty ugly, doesn't it? But in reality, God created them, quite amazing creatures. And he's telling us that there was a certain a goat-like beard appearance to it and that it had a horn at the back of its head, and its eyes were large and gold-coloured. And we'll see from some of the pictures we drew that the skin was very interesting. I mean, the colours of them were actually amazing, not just this black-grey colour that you typically see in a, in a dinosaur book. Um, and this fits with what we'll see in a moment, ancient, do di uh, ancient drawings by the Chinese of the dragons as well. Um, I guess it's true to say that, you know, you think about an elephant, okay? I think, first of all, if it wasn't around today, maybe the evolutions, evolutionists would be saying that it's a dinosaur as well, right? <laughs> and a whale, okay? But they are still around today. And an elephant, you think about it. If we just didn't know, if we'd never seen before an elephant and you found the, the fossil of an elephant, would you know that it's got big floppy ears? Would you know that it's got a trunk? You wouldn't, would you? How would you draw the dragon, uh, the elephant? You know, you draw it from pretty funny looking, pretty ugly looking, I think. And that's what man has done with dragons and dinosaurs. The way God created them, the nose, okay, the ears, and other soft tissue parts, okay, we don't know. But sometimes through the historical record, you get an idea and some of the pictures as well. The travels of Marco Polo. Has everyone heard of Marco Polo? A famous name. Okay, um, Marco Polo um, in 1271 wrote the travels of Marco Polo. Um, in that book, we find some interesting records about his travels around China and what he saw. So he travelled through Asia, Persia, China and Indonesia from 1271 to 1291 AD and recorded his work a journey in a work titled The Travels of Marco Polo, which was published in 1300 AD. In chapter 49, he describes a dragon found in a province named Karajan. This is what he says. Here are found snakes and huge serpents, ten paces in length and ten spans in girth. And what does that mean? You have to look up what a pace means and a, sp you know, a span. It means 15 metres long and 2.5 metres circumference. At the forepart, near the head, they have two short legs. Okay, near the head. They've got two short legs, each with three claws, as well as eyes larger than a loaf and very glaring. Their jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Others are of smaller size, being eight, six, or five paces long. 
So let's summarise what he says. He says this creature he saw, okay, is 15 metres long and 2.5 metres in circumference. How are we going? What do you think about this? Well, here's a picture of ty a Tyrannosaurus rex, okay? So, I don't know if it's a, is the length showing up there. It should be about up to, it just says it down here, up to 46 feet or 14 metres. So it's uh, fairly close. Then it says all the four part, uh, at the four part, the front, it's got two short legs with three claws. Well, that's exactly the case of a Tyrannosaurus rex. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. And the teeth are large, large and sharp. True. Neither man nor any animal, kind of animal can approach them without terror. Okay? So it's clear that he saw something very similar to a ty Tyrannosaurus rex. Elsewhere in his travels, he, he writes that the Chinese emperor had a number of dragons which were used to pull his chariots in parades. Tannen and the prophet Daniel. Okay, this is the final historical one we'll look at. Um, there's an additional story of Daniel including in, included in the Apocrypha. And it's about Bel and the dragon. Um, so it appears in the Apocrypha, and actually which is in the original 1611 edition of the King James Version, as the 14th chapter of Daniel. Um, and the timing of it is basically at the time of Cyrus. Okay, so Daniel's quite old. Um, the original part of the chapter talks about actually um, uh, some uh, a corruption amongst the officials and how they were saying that the God, the God Bell consumes all the food and Daniel proved that basically it's not the, not the God that's consuming all the food but the corrupt officials who get into the temple via a secret tap, trap door. Um, then in the latter half of the chapter there's this story about a dragon. And here it is here in Daniel chapter 14, verse 23 to 27. So we read, And in that same place there was a great dragon which they of Babylon worshipped. And the king said unto Daniel, Wilt thou also say that this is of brass? Okay. So Daniel's trying to say to the king, Well, look, we, we shouldn't worship any gods made of, made of brass or gold. Okay, We worship the living God. But the king at the time, who I think was Cyrus, was saying to Daniel, well, this is a living God. It's a dragon. It's been around a long time. Everyone worships, worships it a as a God. Lo, he liveth, he eateth and drinketh. Thou canst not say to him that he's no living God. Therefore worship him. Then Daniel said unto the king, I will worship the Lord my God, for he is the living God. But give me leave, O king, and I shall slay this dragon without sword or staff. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and did seethe them together and made lumps thereof. So in other words, like salt, uh, tar, poison, poisoned the food that the dragon was used to eating. He put it into the dragon's mouth and so the dragon burst asunder and Daniel said, Lo, these are your gods you worship. Okay, now it's an interesting story um, and how Daniel proves that this old dragon is not a god, he's mortal, he, 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 he can die. Now, th although this chapter is unlikely to be inspired, nevertheless, it serves as another historical record of dragons coexisting with humans that can be dated to at least BC 130, when the Septuagint, sorry, when, when, when the Old Testament Hebrew was translated in Greek as part of the Septuagint, or... AD 150, when Theodosian translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, and there's a bit of confusion there as to what came first in the modern version of the Septuagint. Was it Theodosian's translation first, or was it the older version in BC 130? But at the very least, okay, this story was translated into Greek in AD 150. So it's another historical record of dragons coexisting with mankind. And it's also interesting that we saw on the Babylon's Ishtar gate before they had the symbol of the dragon and Marduk was the chief god, one of the chief gods of Babylon and it was a small dragon that they worshipped. So in 600 BC, for example, Nebuchadnezzar 
had his own pet dragon, according to historical records. And this pic was on, picture was on its city walls. So we've gone through some historical evidence that man coexists at the same time as dragons. So how are we going, Dr. Philip Kitch Kitchener? Solid evidence that dinosaurs and man coexisted would shake the foundations of evolution. Okay, we've looked at scientific ev evidence, we've looked at archaeological evidence, we've looked at, just, just now, historical evidence. And so let's go on to have a look a little bit more at some more archaeological evidence. And China's full of it, actually. Um, in the Shang Dynasty, um, BC 1766 to 1122, quite a long dynasty, the Shang Dynasty. Here we have Chinese pottery, embroidery, carvings. They're all famous for being prominently adorned with images of dragons. Here is a painting that was painted at the time of the Ming Dynasty in China, 1368 to 1644 BCC. BC. So... And note this, you know, what they, of course, they're living how long ago? I mean, you know, 1500 BC, right? That's 3,500 years ago. And there are, the drawings are a little bit exaggerated, a little bit funny, even the way you think they draw people. But you can go and see this today in the Shanghai uh, Museum. Um, but they conceived a four-legged bipedal dragon without ever have, having seen a picture of a dinosaur. Okay, and the artist, for some reason, has made it quite clear that this dragon has three claws on its hand and three claws on its feet, which is exactly what we find for a bipedal dinosaur. And he also drew the dragon with a head crest, a crest on its head, which is confirmed with what the historians were saying, that the dragon has this crest on, on its head, which you don't find from the paleontologist's view because they can't, you know, as they examine the fossil record, that doesn't come out, those sort of features. So possibly what it was referring to, and there's a dragon in, that they call in China today called the Guanglong dragon. And simply this, I'm just quoting um, in uh, Wikipedia here, that this simply means the crown dragon, okay? Because it had like a crown on its head, okay? That's what it means. Um, let's have a look at some more archaeological evidence, this time um, in, in Colombia, in central, central, sorry, central Mexico. Um, they had this pyramid temple that was built in the first century AD, um, and it's to the Quetzalcoatl Pyramid Temple. And you can see here they've drawn the picture of something all the way up the steps. And if you look a bit closer... It's actually the head of a dragon. Now, in Peru, still in South America, the Moshi Indians who lived about AD 100 were famous for their pottery and lots of interesting diagrams on their pottery. Um, and they have drawn, you can see pictures of dragons um, with long necks and uh, like spines, I think, on their the, the, the fin-like spines on their body. But then if you go over to the China, to the Han Dynasty, you have very similar dragons that have been uh, sculpted. And they're on display at, a, at, at museums in all over the world as well, in China and in, in, in the US. So this one's dated to the Han Dynasty, which is 206 BC to 220 AD. And it's, so it's approximately 2,000 years old. So that it looks remarkably like a theropod dinosaur. Again, you see the three claws, you know, on the feet and the three claws on the shorter on the shorter leg. But just putting this together again, we have the same point. What they drew on the pottery in Peru is very similar to what they sculpted in China. So again, how could two completely different cultures, separated by hundreds of years and thousands of miles, sculpt the same type of dragon. Now here's what's referred to as the Nile mosaic of Palestrina and it was a mosaic 
that was made in the second century. And if we go in a bit closer from, from this area here, and we go in a bit closer, we can clearly see that some humans here are hunting what looks like a Tyrannosaurus rex or some large dinosaur. So Ethiopians pursuing what is translated literally as a, a crocodile leopard. So there it is again a bit closer. Now in the US in Utah there's a famous site called the Kachina Bridge and it's got some petroglyphs that were made, petroglyphs that were made by the Anasazi Indians who lived between the AD 400 to AD 1200. And if you zoom in on the circle there, you can see what they drew was very much like the picture of a Apatosaurus, you know, or a, a large sauropod, or a Brontosaurus. And so this shows an enhanced view of it. And in a similar location, you can also find these drawings on the rock walls of other animals. And this is um, one of the large pterodactyls, and it looks very much like what we would see in a dinosaur sketchbook. Um, note the similarity here with the legs and also the head, the type of head, okay? And the image doesn't quite go, but, you know, the, the long beak that this pterodactyl ha had. There's also tapestries, this time from the Nazca tombs in Peru around 700 AD that have depictions of dragons on them. Now, moving over to France, there was a lot of castles that were built in the 1500s. And these castles are full of gravings and sculptures on the walls, on the doors, on the ceilings of dragons. So, first of all, let's have a look inside this castle, the French, the, the, the Chateau de Chambord. My French isn't very good. And this, uh, this person was the name of, um, uh, this was Francius, the king of Francius, the king of France at the time. And he had a number of emblems made after his father and his, his wife and other people in the, who were part of the royal family at the time. Okay, so just like it's heraldry for this, this, this king. So he basically made the porcupine for the former king, who was his father. You can see a porcupine. And then the swan was made for his wife, who was Claude de France. And there's a white weasel, right? An ermine or a white weasel um, was made for his mother-in-law. <laughs> Quite appropriate. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, note all of these were drawn at the time as real animals. And also, Francius had the emblem for himself made of a dragon. And so you go inside this castle and all over the walls, the ceilings and the doors, there are about 800 depictions of this reptile through the castle. 280 are carved into the ceiling on one level of the castle. And they're carved into the doors. They are everywhere. And just zooming in, you can see here that here's one. And look at the detail that's gone in to describe the, the type of skin and it's the structure of its back. Okay. Um, the first, we have overlapping scales that are found on dinosaurs. The second, we have poly, polygonal scales found on other types of dinosaurs. And the third here is a large cluster of raised scales. So large overlapping scales running down the centre of the, their back. They're not just draw, drawn willy-nilly. These are drawn looking at real creatures and copying what the situation was. Now, if you go into this... Uh, to, to this uh, the castle, the French castle, they will tell you that what it is, they're drawings of salamanders all over the place. Okay? Not, not small dinosaurs or dinosaurs, they're salamanders. There's these, these creatures here, which are normally quite small, only you know, smaller than the size of a rabbit, but there have been in some places like Indonesia very large ones. But the shape is very different. Look at the neck, the long size of the neck. Okay? So it's clearly not describing a salamander. 
this is, these are clearly depictions of, of, of dragons. Uh, another French castle in the 15th century, the Royal de Blois, and uh, it's got a, looks like a spiral staircase there, and if you zoom in very close, on the, on the fence going up on this castle, we have, a, again, the picture of a dragon, okay, with the crown on it. And again, the picture, the, the, this was the emblem of the king. And so here are some close-ups of the face, and you can see very clearly this is close to a, a, a dinosaur. Okay, so it's not a salamander, as modern um, descriptions about the place would tell you. It's clearly a dinosaur that's gone ex extinct. Also in the same castle, there's a tapestry, and beautifully woven tapestries dated from the 5th century, and if we zoom in on this area here, we see some kind of very interesting dinosaur. I'm not quite sure how clear that is, but it's quite colourful and got a lot, a lot of frills. And then if we, if we zoom in on another area, there's this the picture here of, a, of what is a baby hadrosaur dinosaur. But again, look at the detail, look at the colouring that's described. And this is what's missing, as I was saying before, in modern depictions of dinosaurs. Okay, people actually saw what these dinosaurs looked like, their colours, their appearance, and they were able to draw them. And so this is what we would say is the modern version. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a juvenile hadrosaur. Now, again... Another castle, the Chateau Azay-Ridieu, again, my pronunciation is terrible, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> as you walk in, another picture of a dragon on, above the doorway. And it's, they're all over the inside of this castle. And this castle has got a, a tapestry, again, sitting on the wall. I don't know if you can make out that, what it is, but if we zoom a bit closer... You can see here a lion, clearly what is a lion, okay, fighting a dragon. Okay. Um, it's worth saying that by the 15th century, 16th century, the larger dragons like the Tyrannosaurus rex had largely become extinct. And so that the dragons that they were seeing in the 15 and 1600s in Europe were more these, this type of dragon. Okay. And this is what the Encyclopedia Britannica in 1768 described. You know, a long coiling tail and bat-like frilly wings, okay? And, and about the length is the same. So, again, this type of dragon was still alive. So, again, you know, how did the French, at such a late date in history, draw these images in quite detail into their castles? They obviously saw these creatures in real life. Now, there's a number of legends all around the world. Okay, the most famous legend, of course, is St. George and the dragon. Um, sorry. And uh, other legends um, from England, Sudbury, Beowulf and the dragon, Wall Dragon, two dragons that were seen fighting in 1449, the St. Leonard's Forest Dragon in Sussex, and the Hendam Dragon in Essex. Okay, and the list could go on and on. But first of all, the St. George and the dragon. And there's a famous account of a dragon slaying is, is the story of St. George and the dragon, which was included in Jacobs de Vauquine's Legenda Aurea, or Golden Legend, a collection of saints' lives compiled around the year 1260 and translated in, into English and published by William Caxton in 1483. Okay, and the famous legend is of St. George finding the dragon and slaying the dragon. And so cathedrals all around the world have been built in recognition and named after St. George. So that's a, an obvious one. Uh, in Britain, um, this is from a chronicle of 1405 in England. And we actually read this at the outset to prove that over time dragons have been hunted by mankind. Close to the town of Burrs near Sudbury, there's lately appeared to, appeared to the great herd of the countryside a dragon Vast in body, with a crested head, 
crest head, again, you don't get that from the paleontologists, teeth like a saw, and tail extending to an enormous length. Having slaughtered the shepherd of a flock, it devoured many sheep. And so descriptions of, of dragons have a remarkable consistency stretching from Britain and the emblem on, on, the, on the flag of Wales, right, is a dragon, across Europe and India and into China. An Irish writer around AD 900 recorded an encounter with a large animal with thick legs and strong claws and described it as having iron nails on its tail. Could that have been a stegosaurus? Iron nails on its tail. Be Wolf and the Dragon. Um, this is the oldest heroic poem in English literature. If you're a student of English literature, this is where they start, okay, in studying English literature. It's written somewhere between the 8th and the 11th centuries. So Beowulf um, is the oldest hero, uh, sorry, yeah, I've said that already, to this point here. Set in Scandinavia, the final act describes Beowulf's fatal battle with a dragon. And the dragon is described as measuring 15 metres long with a pair of formidable horns and razor-sharp teeth and claws. Okay, so where have you heard a dragon? Who else described a dragon being 15 metres long? And razor-sharp teeth and claws. It was Marco Polo, wasn't it? Similar. Okay. Now, the only thing missing there, the, the dragon was described as having horns as well, okay, according to the historical account. And that's the problem. It's the horn material is like fingernails that grows out of them. Okay, you can't tell that from looking at the fossil record because the, the, the fingernail composition, basically, like the material like fingernail quickly decomposes and nothing's left of it. Um, in Wawel, Dra there's the Wawel dragon in Poland, and it's a famous, fa famous Polish po folklore, and uh, it's also known as the dragon of Krakow. And according to the legend, it lived in a cave under Wawel Hill in the 8th century. And the cave, which is today a popular tourist attraction, is on the banks of the Vistula River in Krakow, Pola. The dragon is said to have eaten nearby cattle after many attempts to kill it, and the beast was ultimately poisoned with sulphur by a, name, by a man named Krakus, who later became the monarch and the namesake for the city, okay, the city of Krakow. So here's the structure that you can go there today, the Wawel Dragon uh, sculpture erected in 1970 on the street. In, there's a, an account of two dragons being seen fighting in 1449 in Suffolk and Essex. And this account is a true journalistic, in, uh, uh, in, in a true journalistic spirit, even mentions Christian evening devotions or vespers in one breath, making the report even more believable. So it was a time when the Christians came together, okay, to do their vespers or, or devotions. Um, and it says... It reads like this. On Friday the 26th of December, in the year of our Lord, 1449, about the hour of Vespers, right, devotions, two terrible dragons were seen fighting for about the space of one hour on two hills, of which one in Suffolk is called, I can't pronounce that, but let's have a go, um, Kaidindon Hill, and the other in Essex, Blackdon Hill. One was black in colour and the other reddish and spottish. And spotted. So again, we're getting more information that you don't get from the paleontologists. One was black and one was reddish and spotted. After a long conflict, the reddish one obtained the victory over the black, which done, both returned into the hills ab above named whence they had came. That is to say, each had its own place to the, to the admiration of many beholding them. Okay? So the question is, why would people lie about this story? Why would they make it up? Okay? This is a genuine record of something they saw. Now, also in Sussex, in 1614, there was a book published 
describing encounters with a large reptile in St. Leonard's Forks in Sussex. The sighting was near a village that was known as Dragon's Green, long before this report was published. So the area was famous for dragons, but after, after that, the, this book was published, and here's the, the front cover of the book that was published, True and Wonderful. Okay? And then inside, this is 1614 AD, okay? very close to the time that the King James Bible was translated into English. The translators knew dragons existed, just like the people in Sussex knew that dragons existed. They say this serpent or dragon, as some call it, is reputed to be nine feet or rather more in length and shaped almost the form of an axle tree of a cart. A quality of thickness in the middest and somewhat smaller at both ends. And, and go on, and it's a detailed description. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but look at the picture they drew. Look at the account they made of it. This was a phenomenal event in their day and it was a problem. It was killing everyone. You can see the people that were slain by this dragon. And they had to get rid of it. And they were worried. It seemed to be a baby one that kept on getting bigger and bigger every time they saw it. So they were worried, what's, what's it going to do when it's grown to full size? Um, in Essex 1669, there's the Hennam dragon. And it's a popular name for a large serpent-like creature sighted near Hennam, Essex, in England in 1669. And here's the, the ancient record that they published about it. Um, calling on everyone to help if they can see this dragon. We have to get rid of it because it's causing too much havoc. So there's a lot of historical evidence that these legends, okay, aren't mythology. They're actually real creatures that they saw, they wrote about, and their lives were devastated by, okay? They were terrible wild beasts that ruined, you know, their, their farms, ate all their livestock, and were a menace, so, are dragons pure mythology? Okay, that's what secular reasoning um, is along the following lines as to why dragons is just mythology, you know? <laughs> you mentioned to some people, well, you know, maybe dinosaurs are dragons and they laugh at you. They think it's fairy tale stuff. Well, and their reasoning is that they're not around today, so as far as anyone can tell. Dragons aren't, aren't here, are they? No one can see them. There is nothing like a dragon in the fossil, they say. Um, from the Ice Age, a time when everyone agrees that people were already around because they're looking at a, a, a time frame that humans and dragons are together. And they say in the fossil record, they can't find anything like that. And therefore, a story about dragons could never have been based on actually seeing one. Now, can you see the obvious problem with this line of reasoning? There are creatures identical with dragons in the fossil record. Lots of them that could easily give rises to the stories like the dragon legends all over the world if people had witnessed them in life, namely many of the dinosaurs. And so you can, you, if you go through the legends, there's a lot of common features. They're large rep reptiles with claws and scales. They've got dermal spines, lumps, frills, or spikes protruding from their spines. They're long serpentine tails and often spiked. Some, but not all, have bat-like wings. Their habitat, they're described as living in and out of water. They live in remote areas. The mode of reproduction, they simply lay eggs. And they're ferocious and eat livestock. This is scholastically recognisable consistency. Now, how do they explain, all the dragon legends, how do they explain um, the sculptures that are drawn on pottery and engravings, on the walls, all over the world, on the tapestries, on the castle doors, on the, on the stones, the burial stones, the Ica stones? How do they describe, how do they, how do the evolutionists describe all this? Well, this is their answer. They say that the pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. It is a worldwide phenomenon. And what they say is in the dreams of humans, 
the dragons can be heard hissing and rasping and the dinosaur thunder still. So the reason someone in China, okay, 1,000 years ago, and someone in Peru, let's say 1,500 years ago, was able to draw the same creature is because they had the same dreams about dragons that lived 65 million years ago. That's their explanation. How pathetic. How pathetic. So, the common features, and, and this, this uh, writer, Isaac Derricks, uh, puts it quite well. The claim that dragons are completely mythological and the subject of fairy tales begins to look a bit loose when cultures from literally the entire ancient world created the same fable with the same appearance, habits, ferocity and diet. The fact is, diversity is the very definition of humanity. Cultures based on but breed different clothing, pagan religions, customs, foods and values, and even varying physical appearances. Yet, we all have the dragon in common. In reality, we can say definitely that dragons are one of the few unifying themes in all of the cultures around the world. In fact, dragons appear to be the most documented creature, note this, dragons appear to be the most documented creature in all of ancient history. Only the chronicling of humanity surpasses them. Isn't that interesting? Okay? So there's no other animal recorded in history human history more than the dragon. So this is what the World Book Encyclopedia says in 1973. The updated version, you won't find it there, but this is what it said in 1973. The, the dragons of legend are strangely like actual creatures that have lived in the past. They are much like the great reptiles which inhabited the earth long before man is supposed to have appeared on earth. Dragons were generally evil and destructive. Every country had them in its mythology. And here's a bit of more recent evidence. Um, this is Arizona, 1860. Okay, a photo taken that subsequently then appeared in, in a Believe It or Not book that was published in America in about the 1950-1960s. So it's an old photo of something they took in 1860. Okay, you see the point? What, what have we got here? Okay. And it's interesting that they deliberately created a fake photo of this on the internet that was clearly a Photoshop job, it looked very similar, so when people asked about this photo, they could say, oh, well, that's proven to be a fake. You got what I'm saying there? They deliberately went out of their way to create another fake photo very similar so that whenever people asked about this photo, they could say that that's proven to be a, a fake. They made a different photo. The original photo is genuine. It looks like a pterodactyl to me, but they're standing around. So... Let's conclude um, with the same conclusion we had before, but I think it's worth going over this material again. God created dinosaurs at the same time he created all other creatures 6,000 years ago. And I just want to say that in Genesis 1, to me, when we read Genesis chapter 1, okay, before I used to believe between verse 1 and verse 2 there's a gap of billions of years. Who knows what happened to the earth during that period. But the main reason I believe that was dinosaurs. Okay? Now that I know that dinosaurs were created by God, the dragons, on the fifth and the sixth day of creation, there's no reason to hold that view. And without that view, when you read Genesis chapter 1 through properly, and then Genesis chapter 2, you'll see that what God is declaring is that on the six, day, six days of creation, God created everything, including the earth. Okay? Verse 1 of Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. That's not something that happened millions and billions of years ago. That's something that is a summary 
okay, of the six days of creation. And that's proved by Genesis chapter 2, the first verse is there, where it says, thus the work of creating heavens and earth were finished after the sixth day. And then it goes on to say, and then God rested on the seventh day. And it's also proved by the quotes you can look at in, in Exodus and Leviticus where God talks about the Sabbath law. And what he says there is simply six days, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Okay, so there's just reading the scripture as it is. Think about how King David would have read the Bible. We have to throw away what the world and its wisdom teaches and just read the scriptures as God is reading it to us. Okay? And it's clear that God, in his power and his might, created everything that we know in six days of creation. So soft tissue and red blood cells have been found in fossilised dinosaur bones. Again, prove that, that dinosaurs can't be 65 million years old. The archaeological and the historic evidence we look at, looked at prove that dinosaurs and man were contemporary. The legends from all around the world confirm this. The fossil record is a witness to the rapid burial of animals, including dinosaurs, which occurred at the time of Noah's flood. And the, uh, we've looked at the Bible describing two types of dragons in the book of Job. So the theory of evolution and the lie that dinosaurs existed 65 million years ago continues to deceive many people away from believing the truth. Let's not be deceived about this. Don't trust the wisdom of the world, trust the Bible. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Thanks, everyone.